Hello, my name is Annie Rundy. I'm a ranger at Mount Rainier National Park, and I'm excited to be joining you for the Nisqually Watershed Festival. Sad we can't be in person this year, but I'm excited to be part of this virtual um, edition of the event since that's not possible. Um, today we're going to be exploring Mount Rainier National Park. It is the traditional lands of the Muckleshoot, Yakima, Cowlitz, Squaxin Island, Puyallup, and Nisqually people. Um, these groups of indigenous people have been here for a thousand years and continue, thousands of years, and continue to help us care for the place today. Um, so let's think of them in all that we do and we talk about and um, in our visits to the park. Today we're going to be exploring the upper parts of the Nisqually watershed. So let's get going. Um, Mount Rainier is an icon in this part of the country. We can see it all over the state. Um, from Seattle down to Olympia, it towers over our horizon. Um, and sometimes it determines whether or not we're going to have a good day or not. Um, you'll hear the mountain is out or it's not out. Um, and it is just a huge part of our life here and our culture. But it's not just important for people in the Pacific Northwest or in Washington. It's important for people all around the country and the world because it's a national park. The National Park Service protects over 400 of America's most special places, like Mount Rainier and the Grand Canyon, Yellowstone and Yosemite. Even the Statue of Liberty is a national park. Um, this symbol shows us all of the amazing things that parks protect, like plants and animals, landforms and water, and the shape of the arrowhead reminds us that stories are protected in parks, um, and Mount Rainier protects all of those things as well. The Nisqually watershed starts at the Nisqually Glacier up in Mount Rainier um, at the summit of the mountain. And it flows all the way out through um, many different communities out into um, the Squally Reach in the Puget Sound. Today we're going to be taking four stops right around Mount Rainier in the watershed and um, kind of tracking how it goes through the park, where it starts and where it ends. Um, the Nisqually Glacier is um, one of the most studied glaciers at Mount Rainier, and we'll talk about why that is in a little bit. Um, but first, let's talk a little bit about what a glacier is. Glaciers are basically big rivers of ice. You can see here in this picture, there are um, kind of all of these cracks in the ice, and that happens as the glacier moves but they form from layers of snow piling up and up and up. And then those layers get squeezed together and eventually that pressure makes the snow turn into ice. All of the air gets pushed out. Um, they don't sit still on the top of mountains, however. They do move slowly downhill. And one of the models that we like to use in the park is GAC to show how a glacier moves. So we are going to make a little bit of GAC or slime. Um, and I have a really simple set of instructions for this that um, are on our website and we'll share that link. Um, but this slime helps us kind of visualize how glaciers move. So to make the slime, here we go, I'm going to scoot this back a little bit. You start out with a half a cup of glue, just plain old Elmer's glue, and you mix that with a half a cup of water. And so I already mixed it so that we wouldn't have to sit here and watch me mix. And then in another container, you're going to take a teaspoon of borax, and mix that with half a cup of water. So we'll mix that up. Okay. 
Okay, and then I'm going to put my computer down. Hopefully you can see. All right, and then you slowly pour that in to the glue mixture and mix it around until it starts to congeal. There we go, you're kind of seeing it now. Might have had too much water in this. Ooh, there we go, but here we go. Here's our glacier model. This one's a little runny, um, but if we pretend like my hand is Mount Rainier and we put our glacier on top, you can see it slowly flowing. It's a little too liquid, but slowly flowing down the side of the mountain. And as glaciers flow and move, they change the land around them. Um, right here, you are looking at a valley that is, was carved out by the Nisqually Glacier. And this is a short video clip, and we can kind of see how this glacier has created a big U-shaped valley coming down the side of Mount Rainier. And as the glacier goes downhill and it gets into warmer areas, the, the ice melts from the bottom of the glacier and at the end, and it forms rivers. And that's what you're looking at in this video. The Nisqually, the very, very beginning of the Nisqually River where you see all of that dark rock, or all of that dark dirt and debris. All right. So that is the Nisqually Glacier Valley. We're zooming in on the Nisqually Glacier. Sorry for the wiggly video. Um, over time, as the glacier goes down, um, right now our glaciers are starting to get smaller. And so more of that valley is being exposed as the glacier, the end of the glacier shrinks. And we'll talk more about that as well. So farther downstream, we're now at stop number two. This is the Nisqually River as it's flowing through the park. Glacier rivers carry tons and tons of debris. You can see that water looks almost like chocolate milk. It's just full of dirt and rocks and small silts and sediment. Um, and as it flows down, when it hits flatter areas, it starts to kind of braid and um, drop off um, sediment and debris in different areas and create these little islands in between and you get this really cool braided stream as it moves down the mountain into the valley. Um, but like I said, these rivers are capable of moving big things as well, especially when they're in um, on a really hot day or when they're in a higher flow or a flood stage. Um, this is a huge tree that was carried down, a log that was carried down by the Nisqually River. Um, and you can see the seven-year-old for scale here, um, looking at some of the big rocks that were caused, or that were um, carried down the Nisqually River, probably during a flood or a debris flow event. Debris flows are when lots of water and dirt gets mixed up and carried downhill, um, but that water usually comes out of the glacier all at once. All right. So here we go, we'll go with another video to kind of explore how this river and where it's flowing. This was in the afternoon on a pretty hot day. So high, high river flow. But you can see that's just downhill from where we were on our last stop. So this is the whole um, Nisqually Valley in the park. Even further downstream, we have some um, engineering efforts to keep our roads and um, our uh, park infrastructure in place. This is a levee that was put up along the Nisqually River um, because this was an area that had pretty major flowing or flooding. 
um, in 2006 especially, and the park had to do something to stop that erosion from happening. So this is farther down the river where it's gotten a little bit flatter, um, and you can kind of see how the river has really spread out and braided. There's a number of different channels as it makes its way out of the park. This is pretty much the border of Mount Rainier. So this is right at the end of the park. All right. From there, it continues to flow downstream to the Alder Dam where it forms Alder Lake. And this is a picture of the lake. You can see Mount Rainier in the background. Um, popular place for recreation in this area, camping, boating. Um, but it uh, is also the site of a hydroelectric um, project. So this is Tacoma Power, it's the Alder Dam, and it supplies power, the hydroelectric plant here supplies power um, to communities downstream like Tacoma. Um, and this is the first place along the Nisqually where it is dammed. There's a number of others as it moves down hill or downstream towards the Puget Sound. Um, but eventually it ends up at Nisqually Reach out in the Puget Sound. And so all of those rocks, um, not all of them, but many of the rocks and the sand that started up in Mount Rainier, some of it makes its way all the way down to the sound and connects our communities to the park, which is a really cool thing. Um, but the mountain, and the glaciers and everything in between are being affected and changing right now due to climate change. And so we're gonna explore some of those impacts on our glaciers because like I said before, the Nisqually Glacier is one of the most studied glaciers in the park um, and we are seeing a lot of changes with that one. Um, so this is a really amazing piece of artwork from Jill Pelto and it shows us a lot of the different impacts of climate change. So right here we have greenhouse gases and you can see how they're going up. And this is an actual, this is based on data, so that's kind of a cool thing too. So, um, so we have greenhouse gases going up. As a result, that is trapping heat um, within the Earth's atmosphere and temperatures are going up around the globe. Because of the rise in temperature, ice, glacial ice, is going down. It's melting and decreasing. And a lot of that ice and water, or a lot of that meltwater is going into the oceans, causing the oceans to the sea level to rise. So right there in that really beautiful piece of artwork, we have kind of a synopsis of the global impacts of climate change. What we are predicting, or what scientists are predicting, is going to happen in our part of the country, at Mount Rainier, is warmer winters and longer summers. And with warmer winters, that means we might be getting rain in places where we used to get snow. And so when glaciers aren't getting more snow on the lower parts of them, they might be getting rain that's causing more melt. Um, and so decreased snowpack, um, will cause our glaciers, and longer summers, longer hotter summers, will cause our glaciers to shrink. And that's what we're seeing. Um, these are uh, scientists, well one scientist, Rebecca Lofgren, who studies the glaciers at Mount Rainier. Um, and right here, she, they put in stakes into the glaciers to measure how much snow um, is melting and or snow that we are retaining um, from year to year. So that's one of the things they're doing. They also measure um, different points along the glacier and see how the glacier is changing. Um, and what scientists are seeing with mapping and measuring is that um, our glaciers are melting six times faster than normal, um, losing six inches, an average of six inches a day which results in 18% of glacial ice has melted and 200 billion gallons of water, which is just a crazy number that's really hard to comprehend for me. Um, so, if we want to look at a quick video, this is going to show you kind of what's happening to our glaciers as they melt 
the end of the glacier starts to go uphill and uphill and uphill. And this isn't quite accurate for Mount Rainier because we don't think, well, in our lifetime anyways, um, we will always see glaciers on Mount Rainier. They're just going to continue to get smaller. Um, this is a really great visual demonstration of the Paradise Glacier. Um, in 1934, up here, this black and white image, versus 2017. Um, if we go, we can look at individual points, and that kind of helps you pinpoint the change. So you can see here, tons of ice connecting all the way down. We have just a little bit of ice right there. And then this is probably just debris down below. We see the, the toe of the glacier out here. Right here, that toe has moved way uphill. So uphill is in the direction kind of towards you. And then right over here, we had glacier going all the way out to that crest. Here we just have some probably permanent snow field and it's completely disconnected from the glacier. So you can see a huge change in the Paradise Glacier. Um, many people in this part of the country remember the Paradise Ice Caves, which were a really popular attraction. Um, and those caves were at the end of the, of the Paradise Glacier, and since the glacier has melted, those are no more. So the most popular thing that people went to Paradise to go see, um, we aren't able to see anymore because that glacier has melted so much. Um, this is another comparison. This is the Nisqually Glacier. So, um, I guess our favorite glacier for this purpose today. Um, but this is 1966, and you can, if you kind of look over here, that spot is just kind of right in here, I think. And this is 2014, so huge loss on the Nisqually Glacier as well. But why do we care? Like, why does it really matter if we're losing um, our, our glacier ice? Um, we're always gonna have you know, glaciers on the mountain in our, in our lifetime, so that water supply will still be there. Um, but in the park, one of the main things we're concerned about is that these glaciers feed big river systems. And those river systems a lot of times are flowing through areas where we have a lot of loose dirt and debris and rocks. And if we're going, if we're going to get more rain during the winter time because of a warmer winter, we might have a lot more flooding. Um, when that water mixes with all of that loose rock, we get what we call a debris flow. And this is a picture of a huge debris flow, basically just like wet concrete rushing down the mountain, carries, it takes everything with it in its path. Um, you can see it's kind of washed out this road here um, and threatened some of these structures. We had a big section, of the main road in the park that washed out. Um, it washed out pretty much a campground in the park. And so these big debris flow events have the potential to do a lot of damage to park infrastructure, um, buildings, roads, that sort of thing. They also could decrease access to the park. If we have a road washout and we're not able to replace it, um, or if it washes out over and over and over again, um, we might not be able to repair it in the same place. And that's what we're seeing in some parts of the park already, like the Carbon River and the West Side Road are two roads that we had in the park where visitors could drive all the way up them, but we are no longer able to do that because of repeated floods and debris flows coming through. The kind of wild thing about climate change and all of this, even though we're seeing huge impacts all around the country and at Mount Rainier, we aren't really talking about it very much. And so my charge for you, this, or sorry, this map kind of shows you how many people in each part of the country are talking about climate change at least occasionally. And I think that meant a couple times a month um, for this purpose. But here we go, up in Washington, we're probably around like 40%. So maybe half of us or so are talking about climate change regularly. So my challenge for you, um, now that you know a little bit more about how it's affecting Mount Rainier and the Nisqually watershed in Mount Rainier and the, and the glacier, my challenge for you is to, to um, talk about it more, you know, to tell your neighbors, tell your friends, um, because if we're not talking about it, if we're not paying attention, um, we're not going to make changes in our